augmented reality in the enterprise. It's happening in manufacturing and in a variety of different areas. Today on CXO Talk, we're speaking with Jim Heppelman, who is the CEO of PTC. Jim Heppelman, thank you so much for taking your time and for being with us today on CXO Talk. Great. Thank you, Michael. I'm happy to be here. Please tell us about PTC. You mentioned PTC is a Boston-based uh, software company. We're a global company, about uh, 6,500 employees, a little more than a billion dollars of uh, software sales every year, and uh, a market cap of about $10 billion, you know, trading under the PTC ticker on NASDAQ. So a pretty big, uh, I like to say large, but not extra large software company. You've been in business for a long time, and tell us today if you can summarize your business strategy. We really think uh, our company has a special place at that point where the physical and digital worlds come together. I mean, 30 years ago, our company uh, pioneered the field of 3D computer-aided design, and the whole idea there was to have a, a digital model of something that would later become physical. Along the way, we expanded into uh, product lifecycle management, which is really managing the configuration of those models of those things. And then uh, more recently, uh, we really doubled down on IoT software with our ThingWorks platform and uh, augmented and virtual reality software with our Vuforia platform. And we see IoT and AR as really ways of connecting physical things to digital things and physical spaces to digital spaces so that we can very easily and, and in a lubricated way move information back and forth between these physical and digital worlds. What is the extension or evolution of AR from the previous generations of software that you had developed? Imagine that we started as a 3D company, uh, and then we became a uh, life cycle management company. And it was the idea of life cycle management that brought us into IoT, because IoT allowed us to kind of close the loop during the fielded part of the life cycle of a product, for example. So we'd have a closed loop lifecycle management capability. And then when we thought about, now we have data from things in the field, and we have a 3D understanding of those things, that's a perfect application for AR. I mean, AR is a 3D technology, and we're a 3D company. And AR, of course, benefits from having information that's about the physical world that you could display in the physical world. And that's really what IoT is all about. So it's just been kind of a natural progression from CAD to PLM to IoT uh, to AR. Where are the intersections between the industrial internet of things, IoT, and augmented reality, AR? There's a huge intersection there. And uh, here's the way I like to describe it. Uh, AR is IoT for people. If IoT is about connecting things to the internet so that we can monitor, control, and optimize those things, well, then AR is about connecting people to the internet so that we can monitor, control, and optimize the work of people. And if you think about it, in so many environments, whether it's a factory or a plant or an airport or a bus terminal, you know, there are things and there are people. And it would be ideal to optimize each of the things and people and, frankly, optimize the way they work together. And so, for example, uh, IoT might uh, tell me that a machine is going to have a problem, and I can use that information to direct a worker where to go and what to do when they get there using AR. So it's really a powerful complement that I think is uh, pretty unique to PTC and gives us really this holistic view of connecting everything, including the organic things, in the physical world back to the digital world. We tend to think of IoT as not necessarily a mature technology, but a very broadly applied technology today, especially, you know, consumer devices of, of every description, but AR less so. And so where does the market for AR stand today and where is the technology today, the state of it? You're right that it's, uh, it's at least a phase behind uh, IoT, but I think we're at a tipping point where uh, you know, AR done well requires very good computer vision. And of course, uh, in recent years, uh, phones and tablets, the things we all carry around with us, have become very good at computer vision. So suddenly now, with AR, we have a ubiquitous device that every one of us owns that can do AR really well. 
Now, AR would be even better on smart glasses, you know, like a HoloLens or uh, any of the other varieties that are, that are here and that are coming. But in the meantime, we can all try it out and see its power and see what it means using the phone we have in our pocket or our purse. So I think we're at that tipping point where AR is very practical and everybody's seeing what it is and how you might apply it in business and then shocked at the value it can create. So I think our view at PTC is the market's exploding right now, but it's early. I want to remind everybody we're talking with Jim Heppelman. He's the CEO of PTC. So Jim, it's relatively early stages for AR, yet you have a variety of applications that are in production that are being used by real customers. So please share with us some of those, those types of AR applications. Professor Porter and I wrote an article in Harvard Business Review about a year ago, and during that, we studied all of the use cases for AR in a typical enterprise, and we documented 103 major use cases that ranged really every part of the company. Uh, for example, if it were an industrial company, the engineers have uh, use cases for AR to uh, combine physical and digital things together in a design. Uh, the manufacturing organization has innumerable uh, use cases around work instructions, um, around pick and place, maybe in a warehouse, uh, human machine interfaces becoming virtual. You know, you move down into sales and marketing, and of course, everybody loves uh, the hologram catalog, you know, to be able to see a product, maybe even configure and then see a product as a hologram. Salespeople, by the way, love selling products that have accompanying AR experiences because it's a big differentiator for the product. Then you go out to the customer site, and of course, we can train the customer with AR. We can give the customer a whole new type of digital experience around a product with AR. And we can even let the customer do self-service. You know, if there's a problem, we can step them through what they would need to do to see if they could fix the problem before we dispatch a truck and a, and a service technician. And many times they can. And of course, we could actually jump on a video call with an AR overlay and coach them through, you know, what we think they ought to do in the moment. Then, then you take it downstream from there. Every service organization can get huge productivity benefits uh, by understanding exactly what I should do right now in order to fix the problem that I'm confronted with. And then finally, the enterprise itself is thinking about training can be completely reinvented. Uh, you know, training today for, for uh, frontline workers is really uh, in advance and just in case. And, and we have an opportunity to turn that on its ear and make it, you know, in the moment, just in time, and just as needed. So there's a real opportunity here in every part of an enterprise to reconsider how do we pass digital information on to people and make those people much more productive, much more accurate in the work that they do. We have a question from Twitter, and Arsalan Khan is asking, is the data for AR only machine generated or is it machine generated, human generated as well? And if humans are involved in the collection and preparation of that data, are there biases? And I know in, in AI, we think about that, but is this even a relevant question? No, it's actually, it's a very good question, actually. Um, I think that when we're augmenting information into the physical world, it's a good question to say, where did it come from? Well. Uh, we have information in databases in IT systems, which could be part of the picture. We have information coming from that physical world, sensors and control systems and so forth, and that's part of the picture. And then we can bring in human intelligence and or we can bring in artificial intelligence and then take what we want from that combination and build an augmentable experience out of it. So I would say, uh, could there be biases? I mean, yes, I don't, I don't think that's a major problem, but for sure, any human or AI biases that you'd find in other forms of computing could find their way into, uh, into AR as well. Please elaborate on, the, again, the kinds of data that both human-generated data and real-world data that must come together in order to create an effective AR system for the enterprise. Let me say first, one kind of data we need is some kind of 3D understanding of the uh, physical world so that we can position information relative to that, you know, particularly if we want to do real AR with computer vision as opposed to what some people call assisted reality, which is also valuable but, but maybe not mainstream AR. Uh, so we need to understand the shape of the physical world or the physical object that we're interested in decorating 
so we know where to place the decorations. And then, then the information that we're going to decorate into that world, where does it come from? Well, there are IT systems that know a lot about things and places, and so they have very valuable information. They might know who's the customer, you know, what kind of service contract do we have with this customer. Then there's data from the physical world. This would be data being sensed from the actual physical object or the physical space that we're in. You know, what temperature is it? Uh, is this uh, machine in front of me working or not working? Is it too hot to touch or is it cold? You know, just lots of useful information that I can combine with IT data. And then again, I can have a human join that conversation and become a contributor of AR content. Uh, you know, sort of join the conversation, maybe become part of the augmentable content or feed voice and in, uh, in video into it. And, and then, of course, I can use AI to process any and all of that uh, in the background. So it's really this idea of there are many sources of data. We could, in, in theory, we can build a web page from many sources of data. So I say that think of AR as like 3D web pages. The issue with the web as it relates to AR is that the web is built on a fundamental premise of a 2D page, you know, an HTML page. So you put information on a page and you could collect that information from many places. And then you take that page and you render it on a flat piece of glass. But I don't want to render it on a flat piece of glass. I want to render it on the real world, which is 3D. So if I replace the page notion with a shape notion and I gather data and instead of putting it on a page, I put it on a shape and store that on the server. And then when I download, that shape, I take the data on the shape and transpose it onto the physical world in the same place. And it's a very powerful, uh, I think simple to understand concept if you think of it as 3D web technology. The tools that are needed to create these technologies as well as the data, where precisely is PTC playing in terms of being in terms of all of the all of these components? We've tried to pull together a suite uh, under our Vuforia brand that really has pretty much everything an enterprise would need to tackle most of those use cases. Um, so for example, you need a 3D shape. Well, I mentioned 30 years ago, we pioneered the idea of modeling things in 3D. And of course, uh, you know, the, the, the things you're interested in might be modeled in somebody else's 3D, but that's okay, we'll just use that instead. And then uh, as it relates to uh, uh, spaces, for example, where do you come up with a 3D model of a space? Well, the best thing to do today is to use a 360 degree camera. And uh, for example, we have a nice partnership with a company called Matterport that captures virtual tours of homes. And then using a 360 degree camera, they very quickly create a 3D model of a home that you can walk through to decide if you might want to buy that home or not and save yourself the time of driving there until you did the virtual tour. But we can use that same model you know, to bring together a 3D model of a space, and that's typically like a, uh, like a factory or a, a plant or something like that. So now we have 3D descriptions of things and places, and then PTC has a whole suite of technology to allow you to, uh, if you want, develop experiences against that, um, author them as more like a technical publications author, um, to capture work being done in that space, and then replay it for a new worker in that space, or to have a video call and to bring somebody else into that space with you and let them show you in that space what they think you ought to do uh, on a phone. So uh, we have a whole suite, again, for software developers, for technical authors, for uh, frontline workers to capture and trans transfer their expertise, and then to just do ad hoc collaboration using AR through uh, video calls. You alluded to collaboration. Tell us about that and the collaborative design. Where does the state of the art stand with respect to that? Many of us have a scenario where we're trying to do something. I'm trying to, uh, you know, I'm trying to bake bread or I'm uh, trying to change oil in my car or I'm uh, whatever I'm trying to do, trying to figure out how to download the new operating system onto my laptop. It's not going right and I need help. What do I do? Now, I can call somebody with, uh, you know, any kind of a video call. Uh, FaceTime, for example, on my iPhone. And uh, while talking to that person, I could turn the phone around and show them what I'm looking at. But what AR brings to the table is you're having that same type of conversation, but they can see your environment and we're automatically generating a 3D model. So the remote user can say, see this thing here? And they mark some object in the environment. 
and they're not really marking on the screen. The marks are going through the screen and being anchored against the object in the background. So they can, while talking, also draw in your environment and you can see it. So again, if I were baking bread, they might say, take this cup of flour over here and bring it over and pour it in the bowl and then go get this uh, tablespoon of yeast over here and put it in the bowl and now go get that cup of water. I don't really know how to make bread, I'm just making it up, but put that and then stir it around and I would see all those instructions in the real world and I could just say, wow, it's crystal clear what to do. Thank you for bringing the power of AR into this video call. We've got a couple of questions from Twitter. The first one relates very much to this topic you were just describing. Chris Peterson says, where do you see AR going in terms of telepresence? And then beyond that, will we see people operating machines or cars long distance using AR and VR systems, sort of similar to the way the military dro operates uh, drones? I would say absolutely to both of those ideas. They're both very good ideas uh, and, and things we show people here at PTC in our labs. So telepresence means uh, rather than seeing what you see through my phone, let me become a hologram and stand next to you. And I see you and you see me, and in particular if you're wearing, say, HoloLens type technology, you can really do that in a powerful way. So I think there's a whole new form of telepresence, which is literally project yourself into some, some, some space or some place and join the action. And then uh, the idea of sort of remote control would be uh, put yourself inside a machine, a car, that's a thousand miles away, look out the windshield, and decide whether you should take a right or a left because you've placed yourself in that environment. Uh, there's some other examples that are less intuitive but very powerful. For example, if I had a VR model of a factory, I could program where I want the robot to drive that's carrying the parts around um, through VR. Or if I went into the factory, I could do the same thing with AR by programming you know, points on the floor that I want the robot to follow. So there's so many applications. I mean, it's just a, it's just a treasure trove, if you will, of opportunities to bring real productivity to people. I mean, many studies say uh, people can be made 30 to 50% more productive. Part of that would include you don't have to go there. Just think of all the time you'll save. Um, and then uh, typically 60 to 90% fewer mistakes made. And that all translates into big ROIs, big value propositions uh, for businesses. To some extent, it sounds like uh, something that have, has been, exi been existing in games for a while, this notion of virtual worlds. Yeah, I mean, it is. We're really talking about the mirror world where you create a virtual world to understand what's happening in the mirror image physical world. So games typically don't have a physical counterpart. So you're in a make-believe world, you can do whatever you want. But I wanna put you, or help you immerse yourself in a virtual world that's a mirror image of the physical world, or go into the physical world and bring all the information from the mirror image digital world into that physical world and see it in that environment as if it's part of the environment. I mean, the power of AR is that it allows you to see and process information without thinking about it. You know, if there's an exit sign above a door in a room, you don't even think about that, but you know it's there and you know that's the way out if there's a fire. And that's the power of AR. You don't distract people and say, disengage from the real world and stare at this phone or tablet or, or laptop for a while. You say anything that's interesting in that phone, laptop, or frankly, the cloud behind it, I'll just decorate as sights and sounds into the physical world. So maybe one more point on that. I like to think that uh, if you're thinking about a HoloLens, but this would apply as well to a phone or a tablet, when you put that on your head, uh, bits and bytes coming down from the cloud turn into sounds and sights. You can see data. Likewise, when you generate sounds with your mouth or sites with your hands, that gets interpreted and converted back into bits and bytes going up to the cloud. So uh, this only works with people who are old enough, but uh, if you're old enough, you know what a modem is, which is something that converts analog signals to digital signals and digital back to analog. And, and really a HoloLens or, or frankly, any kind of AR device is a modem. It's converting data into things you can see and hear and you know maybe even feel using your God-given you know, analog senses. 
And so, uh, you know, it's really a way to connect people to the internet. You can, you can uh, both provide information to people and get information back. It's not conceptually different from putting a, a Raspberry Pi with a sensor pack on a machine and getting data from it. It's really the same exact concept, but applied to people. Let's go on to the subject of user experience, customer experience. And Sal Rasa asks this question, how can AR if affect customer experience, but he's particularly interested in healthcare and connecting patients, families, and caregivers. Let me back up to 50,000 feet and talk about user experience. You know, one day I was sitting in my kitchen looking around and I realized that there's a digital display and some buttons and dials on my, uh, on my uh, oven. And there's another one on my cook stove and my refrigerator is trying to tell me what temperature it is, and then I have buttons to adjust it. And my freezer does the same thing. And I realize my coffee maker has a digital interface, and my microwave has a digital interface, and my uh, refrigerator has a digital interface. And so all of those things are trying to talk to me. But they're all trying to do it using crude, proprietary, primitive techniques that I don't really understand that well and hate to have to learn. So all of us have the blinking, you know, 12 o'clock in the microwave. That's why. It's, don't even know how to reset the clock. The point, though, is we can virtualize all that. And we can not only virtualize it, but combine it. So maybe next time I go into my kitchen, there could be like a, think of a stadium uh, display like you'd see at a, at a basketball game, showing the scoreboard and so forth. I could have all those things projecting information up to that central scoreboard, where it's all aggregated together. And by the way, that scoreboard's virtual. I only see it when I look at it with my smart glasses or point my phone up there. And the idea here is we can completely change the way that people perceive things and places and data and control systems and so forth. We can virtualize it all and turn it into holograms and uh, you know sights and sounds, uh, frankly, which Alexa does you know, in Siri at some very small level. But with AR, what we're really saying is don't just stimulate people's sense of hearing, stimulate their eyesight, because eyesight is so much more powerful, and you can still do hearing as well, by the way, but, but really bring people's eyesight into the game so they don't just hear data, they see it. Anyway, I think it's fundamental rethink of products coming down the road because of our ability to virtualize the entire interaction model with them. Everyone, again, we're talking with Jim Heppelman. He's the CEO of PTC. Jim, you've, you've spoken about a variety of different use cases. Can you describe to us today, what do you think is the most common use case in the enterprise today? The most uh, common use case, let's say the low hanging fruit, is to pass uh, guidance and instructional content onto uh, what we'd call frontline workers to help them do their job and not make mistakes while they're doing it. So. Um, Rather than publish information in PDF, which gets printed and they're flipping through pages, trying to understand what that means and, and how to apply what I see in a, in a PDF paper document, or frankly, PDF on my phone, doesn't really matter, how to interpret that and then map it into the real world. You know, I gotta take 2D information and map it into the 3D real world and try to understand how to do that. It's the problem we all have, by the way, when looking at the GPS navigation system in our car and then looking out through the windshield and saying, how do I equivalence those two? Because they don't really look the, that much the same. Anyway, so we can pass that information on and uh, put it right where it needs to be. So while doing the work, the information about how to do the work shows up. By the way, there are certainly medical applications, you know, assisted surgery and so forth uh, for this same concept. But, but really, the low-hanging fruit is uh, companies that have what we call frontline workers, meaning they don't work behind a desk, behind a computer. They're out there in the real world. They're in a factory, they're at the customer site, they're installing something, repairing something, what have you, and they need information. And we can send that right down to them uh, perfectly in context. We have another question from Twitter, and actually this is again from Chris Peterson, who's asking, are there standards in, and protocols in place for this type of AR, or is development mostly ad hoc at this point? I don't think there are real standards. There are some uh, organizations who are thinking about that, but, but I'd say um, to the extent there are standards, they're not really controlling the game right now in any case. 
Um, so today, uh, people are either authoring applications, you know, software engineers authoring applications that contain AR, or there are people using AR tools to author content. So for example, uh, one of the things PDC produces is basically a 3D web publishing tool. So it uses web technology, but again, instead of creating a page, you're decorating a shape, and instead of rendering on a flat browser, you're turning the camera on and passing the content through onto the real world. But it's fundamentally web technology using all the web standards that you'd, you'd, uh, you'd typically think about uh, for authentication, for security, you know, for all of that stuff. It's just 3D content passing through that. So I think that they're not necessarily standards for all the tech. And then uh, I'll tell you, they surely are not standards for the look and feel. And that to me is a, is a bit of a challenge, which is, uh, Everybody's notion of how AR should look is different. And you might move from one AR experience to another and say, wow, it's very different. It's kind of like, uh, you know, before we had standardized look and feels on Windows or Macintosh or, or what have you, there was just the Wild West. And, and I think in AR, we're in the Wild West as it relates to the best techniques for decorating the world in a, in a sort of familiar way. We have a question from Arsalan Khan on Twitter, specifically on training. So what kind of training do workers need to adopt these technologies that for many of them will be so very different from what they're used to? It's funny. I think uh, you don't need much training to use AR because it's so natural. I mean, if you can see and hear in the world around you, AR is just enhancing your ability to see and hear. So the training is uh, put on a device or pick up a device and follow the instructions you see in here. Uh, so I think AR doesn't need much training, but AR completely blows up the classic model of training. Again, the classic model of training is put you in an unnatural environment, a classroom or something like that, and pass information to you that's not very much in the context of the real world. And by the way, you probably don't ever need to know. We're going to train you just in case, just in case you ever run into an environment. And then we hope when, when and if that happens, you remember all this stuff. I always uh, joke with some of my uh, colleagues here at PTC. I'm an engineer, of course. And so I say, uh, how much calculus did you take? And the answer is a lot. And I said, how much do you remember? And they say, uh, not very much. And I say, well, the good news is you never needed it anyway for most people. No, some people really do need it. But again, that was all just in case. We, we trained everybody in calculus just in case somewhere later in their career it would prove useful. AR says, you don't have to do that. Just in the moment where somebody is, tell them what to do. Step them through it, maybe even ad hoc collaboration, help them through it. And don't try to load their brain up with all these ideas that they may or may not ever need. Just give them highly relevant contact in the moment. Maybe just one last example on that, and, and I like to share this thought with people just to get them thinking. Uh, let's imagine uh, I wanted to play chess against the best chess player in the world, Gary Kasparov. Now, for, for various uh, kind of old dog, new trick reasons, I don't know how to play chess. Um, so I would have a very difficult time beating anybody, much less the best in the world. But there's a computer, of course, deep blue from IBM, that can beat Gary Kasparov. What if I put on a HoloLens that was connected to deep blue, artificial intelligence, and I sat down across the table from Gary Kasparov, and uh, all the HoloLens did is say, take this part that's blinking and follow the arrow and move it to this square that's blinking. So Gary would think really hard, he'd make a move, and then I'd just make a move. And then he'd think hard, make a move, and I'd make a move. And I'd win every time, most of the time, I don't exactly know the track record of uh, Deep Blow. But just think of all the training I didn't bother to do to become as good at chess as uh, Gary is. I am as good as chess as he, as he is now, good at chess, uh, but only through the power of AR, bringing the power of the digital world into the game and me just actuating the desire of Deep Blue. I mean, in the chess game, in the, in the local Starbucks. It's an amazing idea that I think will forever transform the way we think about training, uh, both in the uh, academic world, but for sure in the business world. What about the equipment? Because I know that one of the obstacles or resistance forces to adopting AI, say in manufacturing environments, is the size of the, has been the size of the headsets and the fact that the headsets have to be connected to a computer. More and more of the headsets are wireless, of course. Um, but uh, 
nonetheless, headsets are a problem. Now, what I would tell you is that AR really runs well on phones and tablets, but there is one problem, and that is it ties up your hands. So if you're a frontline worker trying to assemble something or uh, install something or repair something, you actually need your hands available for tools and parts and so forth. And so now you need a hands-free you know, hands or a head-mounted device. And so uh, I think probably the best of those is the HoloLens and particularly the second generation HoloLens, but there are others. And what I would say is I expect we're gonna see a dramatic leapfrogging exercise now on the hardware front because you know Microsoft just leapfrogged with the second generation HoloLens. You know, it's highly rumored that Apple's gonna come out with something and, and when they do, it's gonna be a huge breakthrough because it'd be consumer grade, affordable, you know, easy to use smart glasses. Meanwhile, uh, Facebook and Oculus are rumored to be working on not VR, but this time AR headsets and uh, Magic Leap has their AR headset out there. So I think that we're in a position now where there'll be rapid progression, a couple of new devices every year and maybe even every quarter until we get in the next year or two or three to the point where we have a pretty good device. So I look at it and say, my job is to keep the software moving ahead of the hardware. And, uh, and I'm hoping the hardware catches up because what would really burst the dam open for enterprise use would be really good, affordable, head-mounted hardware. Something that was uh, sort of, you know, of this, uh, of this sort of form factor. You know, if I'm gonna put on glasses that do analog correction, wouldn't it be great if the very same glasses also did digital correction? So that the light waves coming in were enhanced, both analog and digital technology, and then when I looked out the world, I'd see everything clearly, but it would be a combination of physical and digital information. You just made a, a very interesting point. You said that your job is to keep the software moving ahead of the hardware. That begs the question, where is the software going? Not in the next five or 10 years, but in the next two or three years. Let me just add a point to that. First of all, uh, we think the software needs to be agnostic or independent of the hardware so that customers can bring their software and content from one hardware device to another you know, as they uh, leapfrog and pass each other. And I think it's a big mistake for anybody to build on a software stack that comes with a hardware stack because I think you're gonna find yourself painted into a corner when better hardware comes out. But uh, yeah, if you think of where's the software uh, headed, you know, we're trying to make, uh, make a nice combination of uh, both object-based and spatial AR, make that really easy so that in a room I can do AR, but if I approach an object I have a deep understanding of, I can switch to a, a deeper understanding. We're trying to uh, bring more um, interaction into the, into the model. You know, uh, for example, the new HoloLens allows you to touch holograms. So now if, if your control panel for a machine is actually a hologram with 3D buttons on it, I can touch buttons and turn them on and off, and now I've created a really powerful uh, virtual HMI. So, uh, you know, we're trying to leverage those new capabilities in the HoloLens. There's telepresence ideas that we uh, talked about based on one of the caller's questions earlier. So, um, the, there, there's just a uh, target-rich environment right now on the software side, getting data from many sources, connecting IoT systems and 3D systems and AR systems, uh, you know, better and better user interfaces. Uh, one of our goals at PTC is to try to say AR shouldn't be for developers. I mean, frankly, enterprises are never gonna make it work if AR experiences are coded in Unity by software engineers. That to me is a dead end road. We need to make it so that authors can publish information in AR instead of PDF or, or Word or what have you, PowerPoint. Uh, and we need to make it so that experts can capture and pass on their expertise without needing authors or coders. And that anybody can jump on a video call right now with anybody else and, and provide AR-based uh, collaborative you know, uh, guidance, let's say. So to me, um, it's such a target-rich environment and PTC is spending a tremendous amount of money on this, by the way, because uh, we think it's a really great opportunity for us to kind of um, ultimately own, hopefully, the, the concept of enterprise AR because we have a whole suite that, that tackles the wide range of problems that an enterprise would, uh, would want to tackle with a kind of cohesive set of technology that works together. Jim, we're going to run out of time shortly, but I want to talk about the industrial internet of things because that's also important here. So I know you, you did touch on it earlier, but maybe give us the 
quick overview. And again, let's talk about that intersection between IoT and augmented reality. Imagine that there's a machine in front of me, and there's me, and the machine is connected to the internet through some kind of IoT gateway, an edge agent, and it's talking to the cloud. Uh, and then I'm maybe wearing a HoloLens or I have an AR device and I'm connected to the cloud. So up in the cloud, it's got information coming and going from both of us. So the first thing the cloud can do is tell me about that machine. Which machine is it? What's it been doing? Uh, does it have any uh, uh, current or developing problems? If so, what should I do about it and so forth? So uh, the cloud might be talking to the machine what it should do next, but it's also guiding me what I should do next and you know what I should know. So it's given me the ability to kind of visually and, uh, and uh, you know, thanks to uh, logic and, and even artificial intelligence, really understand what's going on. But it also gives me a new model of interacting with that machine. That machine doesn't need a screen. It doesn't need buttons, dials, keyboards, none of that stuff. Because now I can talk to it. And again, when I speak, it's not that I'm speaking to the machine. It's that I'm speaking to the HoloLens. And the HoloLens is taking my speech converted the bits and bytes up to the cloud, turning it into machine commands, and sending the machine commands down to the machine in front of me. So I can basically carry on a conversation with my hands and my mouth and my eyes and my ears with a machine just like I'm doing with you right now. I basically am on the same playing field now as that machine. Anything the cloud can do for that machine, it can do for me too, which really lifts my capabilities as a human because I can finally enjoy the benefit of the cloud to the extent the machines have been doing over the last decades. In simplistic terms then, the AR side digitizes me and the IoT side digitizes that machine and then your system brings the two together so that I can manipulate that machine directly it's funny, it feels direct, but in fact, it's th through many layers of indirection, but essentially manipulate that machine directly because of the combination of IoT on the machine side and AR on the human side. AR is IoT for people. And if you think of it that way, now we're both, we're both like machines, more or less. I mean, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna go too far with that, but, but we're both connected in the way that you think of a machine being connected. And, uh, and we're both passing information back and forth to the cloud and through that, you know, to each other and to other machines and things around us and so forth. So I think we're really talking about uh, changing the way humans interact with the world. Uh, and, and that's because bits and bytes become sounds and sights. And we know how to process sounds and sights without even thinking about it. Uh, particularly if they're part of the environment as opposed to put on some flat device that we have to study while looking away from the environment. You know, sometimes, just uh, maybe to give you a thought, sometimes I say do this exercise, you know, if you're in a big room or an auditorium or a shopping mall, close your eyes, open them for one second, look around and close them again, and think about how much information you just ingested. You know, you know where you are, I'm in a shopping mall, I even know where I am, I'm outside the, you know, the, the favorite department store, uh, the bathrooms are down there, there's not many people here today, oh, that's because it's a sunny day outside, I'd see through the windows, and, and all that information, came to me without thinking about it because it was just there and I used my sort of uh, natural, again, mother nature given right to process information visually and with my hearing and integrate it all together without studying it. And anything you put on a phone, you have to study. And if you put words on a phone, well, you can only read words at about, uh, you know, text at about three words per second, which in digital terms is glacially slow. But if those words become pictures that are part of the environment, oh my God, it's so fast. So it's a, it's a very powerful concept. To what extent is the user interface uh, becoming a core competency of PTC and your investment? I would say, uh, think of us, we're creating tools to help people author uh, content. And that content kind of becomes the user interface. So I think... Uh, what we need to do is to be able to pass on to our customers the right kind of uh, style guides and tips and tricks and techniques, if you will, to use our software to produce AR experiences that are really sexy and easy to understand. So I think we need to have that expertise, but I don't think I'm in the business of selling that expertise. I'm in the business of selling tools and, and passing on that expertise so people know how to get really great value out of the software tools that I would sell them. 
So you're selling them the the capability, and it's up to them then to decide how to use that for their particular use case. I'm not selling an owner's manual for a refrigerator. I'm selling software that will allow you to develop an owner's man, an AR owner's manual for a refrigerator, right? To to make that experience 3D and in context rather than 2D and on paper. Let's finish up by talking about deployment. So people are listening to this. They say, yeah, this sounds really good, really great. How do they start? What should they do, people in the enterprise? One thing I'd recommend is uh, go to ptc.com and download the uh, white paper, and not a white paper, the Harvard Business Review article that Professor Porter and I wrote, because it's a completely non, non-commercial piece around the strategy and power of AR for enterprises. And that'll give you a lot to think about. But generally, you want to want to start with use cases. You know, where could you make workers, particularly frontline workers, much more productive and how would you apply AR to that? You know, there's different types of AR I've talked about in the course of this discussion. Which type is most important? And, and the different types have different startup costs, if you will. So uh, some of it, like the video call idea, I mean, it takes you five minutes to get going. You download an app, you make a call, and you're going. There's no implementation, per se. On the other hand, if you're trying to develop your own apps, uh, you know, using computer vision engines and toolkits, you're going to start by hiring developers. And that's a long path to uh, productive use. So that's not to say that's not viable, um, you know, a particular for sales and marketing apps. But um, I think it's really about pick the high value use cases and then understand the requirements to go tackle those use cases and then get started. Finally, what is your vision for where PTC as a company, as an organization is going over the next number of years? Yeah, I mean, again, we're trying to bring these physical and digital worlds together, and uh, and we've identified that IoT and AR are two of the most critical technologies for crossing that physical digital boundary. IoT is mostly bringing data from digi- uh, physical to digital, and AR is mostly bringing data from digital to physical, and that creates a loop that allows us to keep going back and forth between these mirror image worlds. So uh, we want to be the leading software company in terms of connecting these worlds together, in particular with uh, our IoT platform ThingWorks and our AR platform called Vuforia. That's a great combination. They're both uh, leading in their respective fields. And uh, you know, there's t- tremendous amount of business growth, business growth and uh, success out there ahead of us. So we're, uh, we're excited to go after it. Jim Happelman, CEO of PTC. Thank you again for taking your time to be with us today. Thank you, Michael, it was great. You've been watching CXO Talk. Thank you so much for watching. Before you go, subscribe on YouTube and subscribe to our newsletter. Hit the subscribe button at the top of our website. Thanks so much, everybody. We have more shows coming up and we will see you soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.